We're going to finish our podcasts on Chapter 5, Atomic Structure and the Periodic Table, by dealing with a very basic introduction to the structure and formatting of the periodic table. When you look at the periodic table, you notice that most of the elements are metals. Everything to the right of this stair-step line would be a nonmetal, and everything to the left is a metal. Elements that exist along the stair-step line have properties of both metals and nonmetals and are called metalloids. The only nonmetal to the left is hydrogen. As you move across the periodic table, you don't simply jump from being a metal to a nonmetal. Your properties become less metallic as you move across based on the location and arrangement of electrons. The most metallic elements are located left and down, and the most nonmetallic elements are located to the right and up. Mendeleev is the father of the periodic table, and he is given credit for the first arrangement of elements that allowed us to predict properties. He basically arranged elements by similarities and properties and noticed that as masses changed, properties also changed. We now know, of course, that it is the number of protons and the number of electrons that give us the different properties in atoms. But Mendeleev was able to use his very crude periodic table to predict quite a few properties of elements. When you're looking at the periodic table, the group numbers are 1 through 18. That's going down the periodic table. And then your periods go across. The first period is the smallest, containing only hydrogen and helium. The words families and rows are often used, but we're going to stick with groups and periods. Let's talk first very basically about properties of metals. You certainly have uh, properties of metals in your everyday life. You know that they have luster, they shine, they are good conductors of heat and electricity, they are malleable which means they can be hammered or bent, and they are ductile, which means they can be drawn into wires. So you can see that metals make up almost all of the periodic table. Your nonmetals have properties just about the opposite of metals. Nonmetals are brittle, they are nonconductors, and nonlustrous. So your nonmetals, located again to the right of that stair step line, and including hydrogen, have properties opposite of your metals. Your semi-metals, or metalloids, are elements that are unique and have properties of both metals and non-metals. Again, they are getting to that point where they are losing metallic properties and gaining non-metallic properties, and they often have properties of both. They may still conduct electricity, but be brittle. They may be brittle and have luster. So again, it's just a very unique blending of properties as you move from metal to non-metal. It is not an actual uh, classification. Chemists, when you start to name compounds and you are reacting metals with nonmetals, anything, again, to the right of that stair step line is a nonmetal. Some of your groups have unique names that you're responsible for. Group one are the alkali metals. Of course, hydrogen is not, even though it is a member of group one, is not an alkali metal. Group two are the alkaline earth metals. They are less reactive than the alkali metals. Your halogens are your most reactive nonmetals. Again, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine. And then your noble gases are the least reactive elements of all. Again, helium, neon, argon, and so on. The, you are responsible, certainly, for knowing the alkali, alkaline earth, halogens, and noble gases. The inner transition metals, 
located in this area of the periodic table. Again, excuse me, these are simply the transition metals. These are your inner transition metals. The transition metals basically are a transition between these active metals to your less active and eventually non-metal elements. Transition metals have some unique properties that we will discuss in class. The inner transition metals, actually the section of the periodic table, belongs up in here. So that's why they're often called the inner transition metals. The periodic table in that form becomes very long and a little uh, awkward to deal with. They also have some unique properties and include a lot of the man-made elements. Some of the elements that you're specifically responsible for, you have already taken notes in class, but these notes, again, are available for you. We talk about and demonstrated hydrogen. Uh, it is basically in a group by itself because it can act like both a metal and a nonmetal. Makes up 99.9% .9 of the elements in the universe. Exists as a diatomic element, very low density, and reacts, of course, explosively with oxygen. Your alkali metals are the most reactive metals known. They are not found in nature. You have seen them demonstrated, and you have reacted them with water. Again, cold water simply meaning that the water does not need to be hot. They react with water to form hydrogen gas. They're stored under oil, very soft, low density, low melting point metals. And again, you certainly are responsible for the reactions that you've seen in class with lithium, potassium, and sodium. The alkaline earth metals are less reactive than the alkali metals. They're still not found in nature. They react with water less vigorously. They do the same reaction that produces hydrogen gas that doesn't ignite. These metals are harder than the alkali metals with higher melting points and higher densities. Again, in lab, the elements that you have seen are magnesium and calcium. The transition metals, which we've discussed, are very stable metals. These are your metals that you tend to come into contact with, copper, zinc, uh, chromium. These are found in nature. Okay, they do not react with water, but they will react with acids. Most of them will oxidize and form oxides in the presence of air. They are hard metals with high melting points. And again, they include our coin metals, okay, zinc. Uh, copper, nickel, and so on. And I demonstrated that they are the uh, elements necessary in compounds to form colored compounds. So again, when you're looking at your transition metals, you're thinking of gold, silver, copper, and so on. The fact that they are the only metals that can form colored compounds, when you start writing chemical compounds in your next chapter, you would be able to predict and you will do a lab where you create some of these transition metal compounds. We discussed oxygen. Um, oxygen is not flammable, but it is necessary for combustion. So if you have something that reacts with oxygen, it's certainly going to react more violently in a pure oxygen environment. Many of your metals will react with oxygen to form metal oxides. This is simply the process of oxidation. Your nonmetals will also react with oxygen to form what's called nonmetal oxides, carbon, and oxygen will form carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, non-metal oxides. Non-metal oxides will go on to react with water to form acids. And this is the process of forming acid rain, which is part of the lab activity that you do in class. In class, you took sulfur, reacted it with oxygen, to make sulfur dioxide, which you then reacted with water, to make sulfuric acid, which again is acid rain. We also looked at some unique properties of sulfur, as plastic sulfur. Some of the other 
elements that you're responsible for. The halogens are the most reactive nonmetals. They are not present in nature. They exist as both solids, liquids, and gases at room temperature. They are all toxic and corrosive, and they have some distinctive colors. Primarily, the ones that you're responsible for are chlorine and iodine. Iodine was demonstrated in class as it um, is one of those elements that goes through the process of sublimation. Sublimation is the process of going straight from a solid to a gas. Chlorine, of course, is a yellow uh, gas used for disinfectants. It's used in bleach and to disinfect swimming pools. The noble gases are extremely unreactive. We looked at neon. We've discussed that argon is the noble gas found in light bulbs. All of your noble gases are stable. They do not form compounds. They rarely. They can be forced to form compounds, but typically they do not. And they are all gases at room temperature.